Good evening, everybody. Um, it's really nice to see so many people here uh, for our pre-concert uh, conversation uh, for a uh, wonderful concert featuring the music of Arthur Schnabel. Um, we have an uh, interesting array of guests uh, that we'll be talking with uh, this evening before the concert. Um, our two guests that you see up here right now are not performing tonight, um, but they are uh, the director and uh, pianist and producer of a film that was screened at the library last night um, called Arthur Schnabel, uh, No Place of Exile. And so I'm very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Matthew Mishri, the director of the film, and Marcus Pavlik, uh, pianist and one of the producers. Um, so please join me in welcoming them. <laughs> a little ways into our uh, discussion, uh, Jenny Lin will also join us. Um, she just needs a little bit of time to get ready. Um, and she's, uh, of course, a pianist uh, tonight. Um, tonight's program, uh, we'll talk a bit, a bit more about when Jenny arrives, um, but it will involve some solo piano music, some uh, a violin sonata, and also some songs. And the solo piano music will be uh, primarily Ar Arthur Schnabel, but also a Beethoven piano sonata. Um, and on display in the uh, display cases and in going into Coolidge, you'll see uh, it should be open to that page, uh, some of Schnabel's editorial markings on um, that particular Beethoven sonata. Um, of course, this is one of the things for which he was most famous. Um, the violin sonata is Schnabel's, and then the songs will be some early Schnabel songs and then uh, some Brahms songs. And those Brahms songs, as well as two of the three Schnabel songs, we have the holograph manuscripts for at the library. Um, so those will also be on display, so you can check, check those out. Um, so first, I thought maybe we could uh, just kind of introduce people to Schnabel a bit. Um, I, maybe as a way to start, um, how many of you have heard the music of Arthur Schnabel, not the not the pianist, but his own compositions. Actually, a good amount. Well, I'm not sure about the, you got a sneak preview last night. Um, maybe uh, you both could just explain how you came to to know his uh, this other side of him, or just maybe just a, as an intro, your introduction to Schnabel in general. Well, I'm a pianist, as you heard, and somehow got into this role of becoming a producer of a film, which I would never have dreamt of. Um, I n didn't know that Schnabel was a composer until seven years ago. I, of course, grew up with uh, and was taught from his uh, famous Beethoven edition. And uh, I was just Googling and for some ideas for new repertoire to study and came across uh, that there is a piano concerto in D minor uh, by Schnabel and uh, that brought me into contact with uh, the granddaughter of Schnabel, who actually is here tonight as well, Anne Mottier. <laughs> Very big honor that she's here. And um, it so happened that uh, the Academy of the Arts in Berlin, which has uh, m most of the manuscripts, had just received um, the score of the piano quintet. And um, I was struck by it. And the curator also showed me uh, uh, some other works. And yeah, I was just, just got hooked by it. And as I said, although I've done, I'm not a mu new music specialist, but I've done a fair share of new music and premiered piano concertos and uh, these kind of things, I'd never heard of it and so did uh, most uh, of my of my friends, uh, for example, the, the singer uh, Dietrich Henschel, um, who uh, collaborated then in the film with me in one of the songs, uh, he had never heard of it, and he has done a lot of uh, all kind of um, new and uh, contemporary music and newer music, which was really amazing uh, to find because it's. Uh, unique music. Uh, you cannot, uh, it's hard to categorize it. And of course he went through different stylistic phases, um, but uh, you cannot put it in any, any drawer, uh, which may be a, one of the reasons why it also like fell in between um, 
the uh, how do you say the the, the nooks. <laughs> Uh, because you cannot say, oh, this is uh, somebody who is following Schoenberg's 12-tone technique, um, and, uh, or uh, an expressionist composer, or in Mahler tradition, or he doesn't fit any of it. He really found his unique own style. Have you played any of his early music, or I starting at the metronome? Uh, well, I, when I got to see that, I, I, I looked at pretty much everything. Sure. Um, and yeah, the early music, and you will hear some of it, uh, that is in the late Brahms style. Um, and it was very well received. And you got a very good publisher when he came to Berlin, actually the same as Schoenberg. And if he would have s continued composing in that room, he would at least until the First World War, the catastrophe of the First World War, he probably w would have become very, very well known and successful, um, he actually, what happened was he, when he heard the premiere of Strauss Elektra in 1906 in Dresden, uh, that was a shock for him, like it was for many other composers, and he fell silent as a composer, didn't now uh, found, see a way to continue composing in the uh, tonal, within the tonal system, harmonic system, and he came back to composing uh, when um, uh, Arnold Schoenberg uh, rehearsed uh, Piero Lunaire. There were about 25 rehearsals, and Schnabel attended them. They were very close friends. And uh, somehow uh, that triggered his uh, composition nerve again. And you can hear some inspiration in the two works he composes at that time, which is uh, the piano quintet I mentioned, and the notturno. And the notturno, which is like Schoenberg's uh, Verklärte Nacht, uh, ba um, based on a poem by Richard Demel, uh, you can see parallels in, in style, while the piano quintet is actually looking back uh, more to Brahms, Strauss, uh, one could say, so more traditional, although in terms of form, very, very modernistic. And then he falls silent again and really starts composing seriously in um, the 1920, 1921. And I uh, should add it's uh, because uh, his wife, Therese Bear, pushed him very hard uh, to stop, as she wrote, writes to him, stop talking uh, about how you want to compose. Uh, go to this place in Bavaria, uh, spend the summer there, and see what you can actually accomplish, and you find out if it's worth it or not. And he later calls it his happiest time. Interesting. And yeah. Uh, Matthew, what, what drew you to Schnabel as a subject for a film in particular? Uh, quite simply, initially, it was Marcus's passion for the material. And um, uh, by way of, of, uh, of introduction, I'm a non-musician from a fairly well-known uh, Israeli family of musicians. And I grew up surrounded uh, with music, with an interest in music, and I'd made uh, two in a cycle of films about interesting and, and, and notable and strange lives of the 20th century. And uh, I found myself uh, meeting Marcus at a, at a concert in Los Angeles. I then went to see Marcus perform. We became friends. I was making a film in Romania at the time. Marcus came to see the film. We stayed in touch. And quite by accident, uh, in 2013, which is when this project uh, began, uh, I was in San Francisco uh, shooting a television commercial, which is what you, what you do in your uh, spare time to be able to make films like this. And I had lunch with Marcus. And he said, what do you know about Arthur Schnabel? And I said, well, the a uh, set of uh, LPs that always sat on my parents' shelf that now sit on my shelf, the complete uh, uh, recordings of Beethoven, and that was it. Uh, and Marcus said, well, there's a lot more, and I'm going to send you some interesting material. Um, and he did. And some of it was uh, this the wonderful correspondence of Schnabel, which um, Anne Motier uh, has, has very carefully edited uh, over the years and which uh, is now available, uh, many of them. Um, uh, some of his writings. 
and uh, some uh, recordings, uh, some which Marcus had, had made just as sort of temporary recordings of his music. And uh, it was, uh, first of all, very surprising uh, when, when, when one's introduction to Schnabel is Beethoven, Mozart, and Schubert to hear the original compositions is both surprising and exciting. Uh, and I liked the music right away, and it became very clear that this was also a major 20th century life, that it intersected with all of the great figures of that time uh, and had never really been explored uh, fully. And so that was, the, uh, that was the beginning of the project. One thing um, <coughs> that you mentioned in the film and that has some relevance to tonight's program as well with the, uh, the piano sonata, um, there's some uh, kind of idiosyncratic notational things that, that Schnabel uh, kind of pursues in, in the teens and the 20s, I think, in, in particular, I'm thinking of the lack of bar lines. Maybe you could speak to that and how that affects the way that you approach the music. Uh, yes, that is something that um, evidently um, Arnold Schoenberg and, so I should first say that it was Schnabel really who um, helped Schoenberg to move to Berlin in uh, 1908 and uh, to get the funding and so on. And they became a then very close friends. They knew each other from Vienna. Uh, they grew up in the same neighborhood in Vienna. Um, but they became friends in Berlin. And apparently for the next uh, six years until First World War, they were very close and spent many, many nights uh, drinking, smoking, and discussing the future of music and how to notate musical time was evidently a, a big theme. And um, should the, the how to escape the corset of the one, two, three, four bars, which uh, um, bar structure. And that's when somehow this, uh, this idea came up where maybe we get rid of bar lines and uh, just let the harmonic or whatever tensions um, work for themselves. But as a performer, uh, it becomes very difficult to orientate yourself. And um, eventually, they all came back to some kind of uh, metric uh, notation. Uh, Schnabel actually, he, um, he was always very conscious about, about time and timing. And you see that in his editions uh, of like the Beethoven sonatas. And he, um, Later composers, m modern composers like Boulez, so they, they work with um, changing the metronome markings, sometimes like every bar, and that time being able to, to keep a bar structure, but change the timing. And uh, Schnabel actually, in his compositions, approaches that in various stages, um, with not by, yeah, also with changing the metronome markings, stuff like that. Well, one of the, I mean, and, and this is, a, um, it'll, it'll make more sense when you start to hear some of this, uh, what I'm about to say, but in some ways, uh, the music that I hear when I listen to it, I haven't been able to see many of these scores that have the lack of bar lines, but what they, um, what I find with it is there's still this, it's clearly vertically synchronous, and there's still this kind of, uh, resolution of sorts into groupings that feel natural and but I don't know if is that something that you as a performer are kind of uh, imparting onto this to the score or is it something that is kind of a natural outgrowth of well just the way the he's written in it? the notorno which is written notated without bar lines it's easier because you have a text mm -hmm. to follow uh, and that gives you of course a lot of structure and the singing was very very important to Schnabel's style. Uh, he learned a lot uh, from, from his wife, Therese Bär, who was uh, one of the leading singers of the time. And we know also from, like from his son, so how important uh, the singing and that uh, 
following how a, a singer would <laughs> phrase something, or how you would speak something, uh, you know, how you would uh, declamate something, finding that rhythm uh, that, was, that was very important to him. And how to notate that, uh, it's, you need to, you have the structure of the bar lines, but then you need to sense what uh, the music demands, what kind of rhythm it demands, uh, what, how the, the melodic line, where the emphasis lies. And like in a bar, we typically have the one, two, three, four, one heavy, two lighter, three heavy, four lighter. Uh, but you have that also on a, on a meter structure. You have that in the phrases of four bars, uh, typically in classical music, uh, phrase, um, phrases of four and eight bars, and which add up, and rarely you have an irregular one. But uh, Schna for Schnabel, it was very important to also group these, let's say, four bar phrase, and not necessarily the first bar is the heavy one, the m uh, heavier one may be the second one, it's, it's not really a science, you know, and uh, some solution that he found, both in his interpretations and in his writing, you can debate. Well, that's, what, well, that's what I want to ask is maybe you can say something about how this impacts, uh, or did this kind of sense of, of thought about his, own in co his compositions, did that impact his editorial practices or his interpretive uh, decisions uh, in terms of what they c they come from the same source mm. and and uh, his music his writing is really melodic uh, he uh, in a very personal uh, personal style of variation which uh, in a way derives from how Mozart worked um, and so one idea and out of it develops a new idea and they are all related. And uh, if you uh, analyze Schnabel's works, uh, that is a way to look at it. A lot of traditional analysis, uh, techniques of analysis, don't really uh, help you very much with understanding his music. But if you understand the each uh, uh, voice as an independent melodic line, and find the unique character that it wants to express, uh, then you get a sense how it all comes together. But you cannot just go by like, oh, you now we are in, in, in this key and then that key. Um, and that's apparently, I mean, we know from, from his students how he taught that he would like take a Beethoven sonata and they would go painstakingly for three hours through each bar of that sonata and question what does this particular little motif or group of notes or bar mean? What character does it uh, demand? And he would come up with, with sometimes hilarious uh, um, uh, texts to, uh, to a certain phrase which would uh, maybe convey uh, the, the, the rhythm, underlying rhythm or a humorous idea. And he tries to do the same thing in, his, uh, in the compositions of in the 20s where he notates uh, in, in a beautiful, untranslatable um, poetic German, uh, he gives uh, um, instructions like, like a silver hair, um, or with, uh, with the mute power. So, uh, very, I mean, really uh, poetic instructions, sometimes opposing one, like so the first violin has a different uh, um, instruction than the, than the viola, and so on. Uh, he later stops because uh, I, I guess he realizes that first of all, it's uh, what it may mean to him, may mean something different to somebody else, uh, and that you need to trust the, the intuition and understanding of the musicians. But you, you need to look at what each voice, each melodic line tries to convey in, in character. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the unifying element between his compositions and his interpretation. I mean, you find, look at the Beethoven uh, sonata editions, you find it all the time, this kind of, um, of instructions. And one more thing I just uh, um, to point out, 
silence rests were central to his art. He, he once quipped that uh, others may play the notes better, uh, I play the rests better. And the same applies to his compositions. Like in his edi editorial work, he's very precise, saying this fermata should be uh, three beats and then five beats without moving, for example, or five beats of silence, uh, or even five beats in a retardando. So he, 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 he structures and composes the silence. And uh, he may have been the first composer he, uh, who did that uh, in one of his works, the, the ending of the third string quartet, where he, he uh, it's just rests, but he structures these rests. He, he, he composes the silence. And uh, that is a, a concept that later Luigi Nono took up in his uh, st uh, string quartet, um, uh, Letters to Diotima, I think it's called, uh, where at one point the string quartet stops playing and is supposed to uh, silently recite uh, Pohon Barilke. So it's a, it's a lauded silence. So maybe some examples uh, um, where Schnabel was really a, a modernist and, and uh, initiating ideas that later the serialists and, and uh, composers after in the 50s and 60s took on and developed. In the case of Nono, it may even be possible that this is an idea that he somehow got from Schnabel uh, via Schoenberg, uh, it's because he was after all the Schoenberg's uh, son-in-law. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, it's, uh, this is all fascinating. I'm wondering maybe we should uh, take a step back uh, from the, and kind of come back at it from um, the standpoint of this, following this journey that he's on. He's living in so many different places, and um, maybe Matthew can speak a little bit about uh, what that process was like for you in kind of exploring both physically and, you know, emotionally and uh, otherwise his path. Sure, well, it was, it, was, uh, it was certainly a life that was, um, you know, marked by, uh, well, by his exile, but by leaving places, uh, and, and that interested me. But um, something I think more uh, primal that interested me was uh, the music, at least in my uh, interpretation of it, um, had something in common with other films I'd made in that there was an element of, uh, of, of landscape painting. And uh, Schnabel certainly was deeply influenced by the landscapes of, um, of uh, Switzerland in particular and uh, the places where he lived. And as Marcus says, I think very poetically in the film, you can feel the, the colors of the lakes and the mountains and the clouds in, in his music. And so that, that interested me a lot because I tend to make um, uh, films that are defined by, by places and by landscapes. And a lot of, um, uh, especially a lot of uh, documentaries that are commissioned for television mostly consist of talking heads in front of a black curtain and archival photography. And uh, our film has no archival photography until the final credits. It tries to place Schnabel in the here and now. Um, so I think the music is, uh, is, is ripe for rediscovery, it's not dead music. And um, the places that inspired the music, the emotional landscapes of his life become uh, the textures of the film. So instead of a lot of uh, you know, people sitting in front of black curtains, uh, I used uh, helicopter drones over the Swiss uh, Engadine and various gauges of film stock, uh, Super 8 and regular 16 film stock. And we opened up the visual language uh, of the film to uh, convey I th what I thought were uh, some of the ideas that were maybe conveyed in the music about place. Although um, we might uh, experience and, 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 and think that we hear the landscapes and that is uh, what inspired Schnabel, he, I understand, objected very strongly to that, that there were any extra musical uh, um, inspirations to his music. So of course but the beauty of, 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 of music is that it lives on and interpretation uh, takes on many forms. <laughs> well, I'd like to um, welcome uh, Jenny Lin. Uh, <laughs> we have kind of a, a rare occurrence right now in that we have two pianists uh, up here who have actually played Schnabel's music and there's just not uh, we hope that that, that that number is going to keep increasing and increasing, um, but this is kind of a, a 
novel locus here. That's uh, that's fantastic. Um, and so we uh, just a little bit earlier, uh, Jenny, we were talking about um, just some of the things, that, uh, interesting things about uh, about Schnabel and how people came to to know them. We're wondering if maybe you could say a few words about how you came to know him. Uh, perhaps I don't know whether it was through Beethoven first or or how you came to know him as a composer, etc. Um, I think every pianist grew up with Schnabel's recordings of Beethoven, Schubert, everything. And um, I was also blessed with teachers like Julia Martin and Leon Fleischer. So I feel like I'm part of the tradition. And I was telling the Schnabel family, I feel like I'm the fourth generation. <laughs> um, so in my education, the name Schnabel, maybe Arthur or Karl Wurig, was definitely something I kept hearing. And both Fleischer and Julia Martin, they always speak about how how they taught them. So, um, but I only came to discover Schnabel's music two years ago, two and a half years ago, which is not long ago. And it was by total coincidence. I was having a meeting at a publisher for something totally different. And on the desk were, were a pile of music and it said Arthur Schnabel. And I was really confused. And I said, the pianist Arthur Schnabel? <laughs> And he said, yeah, didn't you know he was a composer? And I was completely in shock. And so the publisher handed me a stack, a stack <laughs> of piano music. And so I went home, read through it. I was so impressed. I ran to my record label and I said, we have to get this recorded, all of it. And they said, yes, let's do it. And that's what happened. And so from that moment, I got to know the Schnabel family. And I started to learn about him as a composer, you know, you, you learn about somebody through their art. And so you learn a little bit about Schnabel, the pianist, but through his music, you can really feel Schnabel, the person. And I think that that was a very private side for him. And there's a reason why he didn't try to, you know, trumpet his compositions to the world. It was something that he enjoyed so much. He, I think you probably talked about it. For him, he was a composer first. And that is so incredible, coming from one of the most amazing pianists of all time. So I'm very jealous that he could do both, <laughs> because I couldn't compose. But that's kind of what happened. So I'm very new to Schnabel, the composer. Um, as you came to know it, did you uh, approach the early music that you're going to be playing versus the later stuff in different ways? Or Because I know you have a, a wide range of repertoire that you perform, so um, did, it, did it feel like the same composer throughout, or did it feel like there was a breaks, or, or just different? The early works, um, the ones that you hear tonight, that he wrote as a teenager, at first you don't feel that that can't be the same Schnabel, but then there are certain places in the music, you know, for example, he would hold a pedal to hold the tonic note for a very long time, and that's something that Beethoven also did later on which is interesting because that is so ahead of his time to have all those resonance. And what's amazing in the early works, you hear he's trying to use the instrument in such a different way. It's a sound making instrument. And same thing eventually later on, of course the harmonic language changed completely, but he was the, the harmonies and the overtones that he creates out of an incredible Steinway D. I think that's the best thing for me is the colors. You know, I get this sense from, uh, uh, we won't hear this piece tonight, but I think it's the, I think it's the last one of Opus 14, the song set, which is, it has the really high registral types of things. There's these textural things that he does that, that feel um, you know, less of like a, an accompanimental sort of uh, focus, but is more of, a, more of a sound impetus for doing it, even in that idiom of the, this late Brahms sort of idiom. So I, I could see that yeah. sort of a thing that hangs over into the, the later piano works too. His, his songs are so beautiful. And there's, su there's such a human quality to his music. And even when he was 16, the second piece from the, f the, f the fantasy pieces that you hear tonight has one of the most beautiful melodies I've ever heard. And, and that to me at 16, wow, he was so mature. And that, I got hooked when I played that. 
And then I got in, into his, um, the very difficult stuff, which was so dramatic and everything that, that Marcus was saying, you know, just describing his life and wh where he was living. And Let me ask you about, um, and you, you don't have to, uh, this isn't a, a confessional or anything like that, but do you use or have you used the, the Schnabel editions as kind of a performance edition of the, like say the Beethoven sonata tonight yeah. or any other things or is this something that you reference is, or how does this impact your playing of that type of repertoire today? Um, or how I, do you I have that? about five different versions of mm -hmm. the Beethoven sonatas and I love them all but you can't really follow just one because we all have different fingers. I mean, the way our fingers are built are just so different. I mean, I have so much respect for Arau, Schnabel, all of them. And, but you cannot just follow one because my pinky's a little shorter than others. And so the fingerings already is different. It was actually a, a, a fascinating thing I learned when I saw uh, a plaster of Schnabel's hand in, in, mm -hmm. in Berlin. Uh, he used to even teach that the fingers shouldn't leave the keyboard. And um, it turns out that actually his fourth and fifth fingers had almost the same le length uh, as the third finger. Hmm. He had a very large hand to begin with, but he had very l unusually long fourth and fifth fingers, which made it possible for him to do certain things. But he also followed uh, very much in the, in the tradition of Chopin to that, that we should be happy that uh, every one of our fingers has a different character and use that for musical purpose. And that is, like when you look at his fingerings, uh, uh, he's not finding at fing fingerings that uh, are the easiest, the most comfortable, the, the safest, but the ones, especially in the slow movements, the ones that um, enable you to produce just the right uh, kind of tone or, or um, uh, melod melodic line uh, inflection and um, but again as, as Jenny said uh, each uh, everybody's hand is different but you can uh, learn uh, if, if Schnabel attributes the fourth finger to a certain beginning of a phrase uh, it gives you a sense that uh, it should probably start his from his uh, perspective with a certain tenderness uh, instead of using the thumb or the second finger uh, so even if it doesn't work for your hand, uh, it c uh, especially from the fingerings, you can uh, get a window in his, uh, how he understands a certain, certain phrase. Yeah. Um, Jenny, I'm wondering if we can, um, if you could say a few words about some of the other pieces on this program, because they're, we've been speaking a little bit, um, s some specifically and generally about some of these different types of music that Schnabel wrote over the course of his life, but to me, some of the later music that you're, the two examples that we'll have of the piano sonata and the violin sonata are so different. In, uh, so maybe you could say a bit about, um, about each of those pieces and your experience with them. Um, so there are three sets of Schnabel pieces that you hear tonight. One is from when he's 16, another one from when he was in his 30s, and one from in his 50s. And I think the one from his 50s is the violin sonata. And it's extremely advanced, um, the language and the writing, and extremely uh, complex, and as if he has reached a certain maturity his, for himself, and he was so comfortable at writing very complicated and complex textures. The sonata he wrote in his 30s, you still have the sense of the drama that you hear in the teenage pieces. So it's a combo. So the, 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 thir the, the piano sonata that you hear is almost like the combination of when the younger Schnabel and the mature Schnabel. Right. So you really get a sense of him through s three different periods. And the songs, I'm not sure when he wrote th those actually. Uh, eight, between 18, uh, 18, 1899 and 1902. Okay, so he was, he was young. Yeah. But the language was already very advanced harmonically and rhythmically, he's switching between three, four to six, eight, sometimes seven, eight, and it's never really grounded anywhere. And it's sort of this very improvisational feel, even though everything is very clearly notated. But the melodies are just so beautiful, as you would hear Marlissa, who is an incredible singer. She brings out the really, truly human 
side of Schnabel, the composer. There's also, <coughs> excuse me, I'm falling apart over here, but <laughs> there's a, um, in the highest sentence, I think, uh, that this, there's this element of instrumental composition almost in it as well. And just the way he treats what is simple and just gorgeous material um, kind of differently and has it develop in a very um, just fluid and beautiful way throughout the song. W as a, Just within this little tiny fragment, I think that that shows a certain um, precocity or something that of the type of uh, composer he was going to be, even though it's a very different idiom. But at least that's my take on it. Well, I think <laughs> I think he's he's an artist who's constantly challenging himself, and constantly trying to find new things and trying to get better and better. And you can hear that in the music. And I mean, that's an incredible human being, an artist who, as famous as he was, he was still striving to be better. Hmm. And so that that's that's really amazing to to witness the the progress. Do you, do any of you know much about? Uh, performance history during his lifetime. I know that there that there was a performance of the first symphony in the late 40s, but um, and there was performance of the chamber music and that he played, of course, the early songs. Uh, yes, well, um, the, the songs were written for his wife, Therese. So sh they performed them, she performed them. Um, then outside performances really started in the 1920s when he wrote the string quartets. Um, initially, the Havemann Quartet, which was a very renowned quartet, uh, premiering works by Schoenberg and, and I mean the um, modernist composers of the time. Uh, and then, actually, on the uh, initiation of Hans Eisler, Hans Eisler t uh, taught the Kolisch Quartet, which pr arguably was the leading quartet for uh, ambitious new music uh, in Germany in the 1920s. Uh, Hans Eisler t told them about Schnabel and uh, hi um, his amazing music. So they took on to study uh, the third, uh, third string quartet and premiered it. And um, there's a very interesting letter by Kolisch uh, where he, he says that it was extremely difficult to understand the piece and to find out how to uh, to play it because so different than the, uh, all the other repertoire that we were playing. Uh, but they think they finally found the key and uh, whatever he will write in the future, they would premiere. Now, of course, um, which is, was really a big honor. And uh, unfortunately then, uh, Hitler came about and all uh, everything after that, so that never happened that they premiered another piece. But uh, from then on, um, in the in the 30s and especially later in, in, in America, uh, his works were performed, and uh, um, his last work, which he never got to hear, the Rhapsody for Orchestra, was a commission by George Sell for the Cleveland Orchestra, and. Um, so, he, had he lived longer, I mean, he was about to retire as a pianist, I think for good in the 50s, when unfortunately then he, he died. Uh, I think we would have seen uh, really an uptick in, in performances in his, in his time. So, uh, he didn't push, he didn't perform his own music, yes. He didn't push too hard that others play it, but he did some of that, and uh, um, because I think the, the war and the exile in America and all these things played also a big part, and the changes in style and, Pu public, and, taste and public taste. Public taste, yeah. yes. Public taste eventually caught up to what he was trying to do, and by then he had passed away. But thanks to uh, institutions like this one, maybe there will be another, another life for some of this music. Yeah, that's definitely a hope that we have. And so we're uh, so pleased that you did the film. We're so pleased that you're doing this concert tonight. And just your advocacy of this music, I think, is just wonderful and very helpful. That's my personal opinion. Um, so I'm very excited about it. I was thinking, um, just we don't have too much time left. Um, maybe we could take some questions from the audience, if they have any. If I just ask if you could wait for a microphone to come to you, and, and Jay will bring it to you. 
So at, in the film last night, Leon Fleischer was crediting um, Arthur Schnabel for basically um, <laughs> creating him in a, in a sense, of, if I'm not over um, paraphrasing. No, that's what he said. Um, yeah. Exactly <laughs> what he <laughs> said. <laughs> what I said, yes. And so I'm wondering, Jenny, since you said you had studied it with Leon Fleischer, did Leon Fleischer play Arthur Schnabel's own compositions, or what was the relationship between that and it sounds like you did not learn about these compositions from Leon Fleischer. So I remember he did talk about trying out one or two pieces. I think maybe the Schnabel family could confirm that or they know more about that. He actually recorded the duodecimet. Oh, yeah. there we go. Okay. Yeah, so, but no, he did not tell me that Schnabel was a composer. Oh, because he was <laughs> not promoting. Uh, okay. Yes, he, was, ah. he would tell me what Schnabel told him. Mm. Mm -hmm. But. Um, I believe there was no lesson, at least no master class, and my friends who studied with him said there's not one lesson where not at least one time the name Arthur Schnabel fell. And I, I think that, uh, you know, Fleischer really best sums up uh, Schnabel's compositions and his over. He says it in the film, he describes it as cosmic music, as a key that opens uh, a door to another world. And that's how I felt about it when I heard the music. I felt that there was a somehow a, a mystical or a spiritual content to the music that maybe people had missed. And uh, Fleischer really uh, feels that about Schnabel's music. Which is where he stands out for me as an interpreter, because he finds that, like, especially in the, in the slow movements of Beethoven sonatas, he just finds this key and then opens uh, us to a transcendental uh, experience. A few quick questions. Um, I, I was not able to uh, attend the film last night, so you may have addressed some of these questions in that. Um, what, what is the state of interest and in performance of Schnabel's music in Europe uh, right now? I know that in the US, the violinist Paul Zukowski played some role in getting a lot of it recorded. Did you have any contact with him? And finally, uh, what was Schnabel's relationship or friendship with Schoenberg? Well, that's a very long uh, um, <laughs> explanation. So Everything has been recorded, and Shukovsky was very, uh, very essential to that, uh, the, all the symphonies oh, and, so and the you. works of, uh, for violin. Um, and so did a uh, wonderful uh, uh, German violinist, uh, Christian Tetzlaff. He recorded that. Um, it's not been performed much. And the Schoenberg uh, relationship, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, they, they, they were friends in, in Berlin. Schnabel never wanted to follow any schools or uh, systems for the sake of a system. And that is something I think Schoenberg never really accepted, that after he invented this null system that in that sense, he was quite a fascist, you could say. Uh, and, but, that, no, but the question yesterday came up uh, about Schnabel not performing his own music. Uh, it was not only his own music. Uh, he didn't play any contemporary music, although he very strongly believed that you had to compose in a modernist way, that you couldn't go back. Um, and the only works that he performed were Pierre Lunaire, and um, uh, um, Ernst Krenek, um, because, but because his wife asked him to, I think. Um, and Schoenberg bugged him again and again uh, that, first of all, he should play more uh, contemporary com uh, composers, that it's his obligation to do that. And apparently they had really uh, big fights about that. And he really wanted him to premiere his piano concerto. And he didn't. And my impression is from various sources that he, after he had declined for good, he realized that he had made a mistake. And he then sends Schoenberg his fifth and eventually last string quartet, where he uses some, I mean, there's a, you can discover a row in there if you want to. You know, that, so there is a direct relation to Schoenberg, and he sends that to Schoenberg, and Schoenberg never acknowledges it, receiving it. He later sends a postcard asking me, did you receive my baby? No response. Um, they stay on friendly terms, uh, exchange birthday greetings, 
um, but you see a certain tension there, yeah? Uh, and, uh, and they died within a month of each other. They died within a month of each other. They had the same initials, and uh, Schoenbeck died on July 13th, and uh, Schnabel died a month later on August 15th, 1951. Um, so, yeah, there is uh, a lot of uh, connections. So those are, uh, I know there's a lot more to say about those kind of broad questions. Are there any other ones specifically? Um, if you could just wait for the microphone. Oh. Oh, it's coming shortly. That's a very short question. Oh. We just still need to record for it. For yeah. those of us who couldn't see the film last night, where will it be available and when might we see it? Thank you for asking. The film has uh, finally been released uh, definitively in the U.S., and you can get it through Amazon, actually. So uh, Amazon Prime Video. And if you know other people who might be interested in... Uh, the title again is... Schnabel, No Place of Exile. If you know other people who you, might be interested in content, you, you can find it put that way. If you Google just Schnabel in film, the website will come up, and uh, I mean, it should be easy to film, uh, to find. Yeah. As, as uh, Matthew's first film on... Uh, Moldova, you can see that on uh, Amazon, too. Uh, you can see Absolutely. that right, right now. My Fascinating question. film. I, I placed that guy in the audience tonight <laughs> just to no, I, you, that, ask that question. <laughs> that was from last night. I asked you that last night. The question is for, 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 for um, Marcus or, or, or David, and then I have a quick question for Jenny. Is uh, Because we're in this distinguished hall, uh, I, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but uh, David was at the Bar Talk 5th, and the Schoenberg Fourth that had their world premieres in the Coolidge Auditorium under the Kolisch Col String Quartet. Yeah, so the fifth quartet, the Bartok was a Coolidge commission. Okay. And then uh, so was the Schoenberg Fourth. And they were the Kolisch String Quartet that you were just. I believe so. Yes. And then, Marcus, yeah. my question to you would be did, did the Kolisch String Quartet, to the best of your knowledge, ever do any one of the five Schnabel? Quartets. What's they, the they performance? Premiered num they premiered the third. The th they did. Good. They Thank premiered you. the third, yes. Perfect. Then the last the follow up question would be Jenny, uh, when can we start hearing some of your uh, recordings of, of this, this um, piano? Music? My Schnabel yeah. recordings will be officially released February, March of next year. <laughs> yes, I'm very excited. Oh, yes, yeah, Steinway label. <laughs> it's two hours, no, more than two, two and a half hours of, of, of complete piano music. Yeah. All right, um, any, we have time for one more question, if there is one. Going. All right, oh, there's one more. Okay. Um, connections with visual artists. Um, and Arthur Schnabel, um, did he have any close friendships with uh, painters, for example? Because um, there were a lot of color theories and people espousing and writing, um, just like the, you know, on the 12 tones, all sorts of theories about colors. And well, I guess it's a good opportunity to uh, make a pitch that you should uh, find and read the letters uh, because one of the sort of great things you'll discover about Schnabel is that uh, he was interested in absolutely everything. There was no uh, area of intellectual life in Europe and then in America that, that he wasn't interested in exploring or, or intersecting with. And um, he has quite a lot to say about art and literature and in many languages. And poli uh, politics. And politics. He was yeah. very, very prescient uh, of developments and uh, uh, was following politics and... Uh, societal developments. Actually, one thing that, that wasn't mentioned in the film, but I, I, I discovered is uh, how influential was he was actually in shaping uh, education policies in Germany. Uh, we associated uh, in Germany with the name Kestenberg, who was a minister in the Prussian, um, uh, in the Minister of Culture, but he was a close friend of Schnabel, and uh, the ideas that he um, put in motion uh, came actually from Schnabel, many of them. And one, one sort of incredible uh, takeaway from, from the project was he was you know, both a, 
really, truly a man of letters in every sense, but he also had a, a really wonderful sense of humor. And all of this comes across in, uh, in this, this wonderful collection of letters. All right, well, on that note, um, please join me in thanking our guests, and we look forward to the concert. Thank you.